Hi, in this presentation, I'd like to discuss how I've used a historical lens to think about the behaviour of a group of institutional investors that has become a significant force in the Australian market, and in particular in the governance of our public or listed companies. These investors are what we call industry superannuation funds. These funds are a type of pension fund. They take uh, contributions paid by employers on behalf of workers and invest those contributions with the objective of providing uh, workers with a um, nest egg of money to use to fund their retirement. Um, in Australia, we call this superannuation rather than a pension uh, because the term pension tends to be used in a narrower sense to refer to a social welfare payment uh, made, by, made by the government to older Australians. Now, the industry superannuation funds were historically associated with particular industries or sectors in the Australian economy, and that's why the word industry uh, appears in their name. However, today they are very much open to take contributions paid on behalf of workers in any sector of the Australian economy. Um, before turning to historical matters, I want to spend a few minutes talking first about the contemporary relevance of the industry superannuation funds. Now, industry superannuation funds are not the only type of superannuation fund operating in Australia, but they are the most significant type. Uh, they collectively hold the most superannuation assets under management, about $1.2 trillion worth. About 20% of those assets are invested in Australian listed equities. And to put those numbers in context, the current market, total market capitalization of our listed company market is about $2.6 trillion. Um, the industry funds tend to concentrate their listed equity investments in larger, the larger listed companies. Uh, the sector has claimed that um, uh, the sector collectively owns, on average, 10% of each of the 200 largest listed companies in Australia. Now, um, uh, in order to complete the picture about the financial significance of industry super, superannuation funds, I do need to refer to two additional important points. Um, first, superannuation assets are forecast to double by the end of this decade. And much of this growth will occur in the industry funds because their membership tends to be on average younger, which means that those funds are still very much accumulating assets on behalf of their younger workers rather than paying out assets to retired workers. Um, now, that means that the asset under assets under management figures here on the slide and the total dollar value of those assets that will be invested in Australian listed equities are likely to increase significantly in coming years. The second point that needs to be noted to, to put the economic significance of these funds in context is that there has been a significant amount of merger activity and fund consolidation in recent years, which has produced a handful of quite large industry funds. So we have two with assets under management uh, in excess of 200 billion. We've got one that sits between 100 and 200 billion, and we've got four that sit between 50 and 100 billion. Now, of course, those figures are going to go up significantly in line with the growth profile that I just mentioned. So in summary, the industry fund sector is economically significant. It will be even more so in the coming years, and it is um, uh, dominated um, by a handful of large funds, which are on track to become even bigger fish in our moderately sized market in coming years. Now, not only are the industry funds economically or financially large, um, they are um, uh, from a corporate governance perspective, uh, proactive and engaged in the governance of Australian public companies. And I've highlighted three notable examples of their shareholder activism on this slide. I want to comment in particular on the last example, which refers to uh, the efforts last year of our largest industry superannuation fund called Australian Super, 
to block a, a, a recommended takeover for Origin Energy, um, uh, which valued that company at about 20 billion Australian dollars. Now, Australian super deployed almost hedge fund-like tactics to block the takeover. Uh, in particular, it increased its stake in Origin during the pendency of the takeover from 11.5% to 17.5%. That 17.5% stake is, is valued today uh, at $2.5 billion, um, which underscores the, the, the high stakes nature of Australian super's uh, efforts in relation to defeating the takeover. And Australian super ultimately used that 17.5% stake uh, to block the merger vote. And so the takeover didn't go ahead. Now, Australian super um, uh, 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 pushed on with this strategy, notwithstanding significant market scrutiny of the strategy, and in some cases, um, outright hostility from certain investor groups, investors and commentators who, who really felt that the origin takeover should proceed. It was at a very attractive premium. Uh, and 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 there was a view that it would significantly help Australia's transition um, to a low carbon future. But Australian Super was so determined to keep um, Origin Energy listed and not to um, have it sold to the potential buyers. Um, it was so assured of its strategy that it pushed on through that scrutiny and, in some cases, um, hostility and. You know, this really is an extra or was an extraordinary incident that um, certainly um, does not reflect the dominant paradigm in contemporary corporate governance literature regarding rationally reticent institutional investors. Um, I believe the, uh, the, the developments that I've been talking to over the last couple of sli slides regarding the, the growth profile of the industry fund sector and their proactive involvement of, of in the governance of our large listed company means we really need to be reconceiving uh, uh, you know, or, or, or changing how we think about these investors. And specifically, I think we need to conceive of them as having become uh, gatekeepers to the Australian listed equities market. And in a current research project, I'm exploring the implications of this development for Australian corporate governance. So how is a historical perspective relevant to my research project? Well, it's relevant because it shines light on some factors and issues that would not necessarily be captured by the conventional analytical approach, which is typically used when thinking about the behaviour of institutional investors in, in, in public company corporate governance. Now, that conventional approach is agency theory. Now, don't get me wrong, an agency theory lens is by no means inappropriate and, and, and certainly is capable of yielding some important insights about what makes institutional investors tick when it comes to corporate governance. Um, but an agency theory approach is, is typically focused very much on the present um, and it has a laser-like focus on things like economic incentives, costs, and competitive pressures. Um, uh, it does not tend to focus uh, or factor in things like institutional origins and how they might exert ongoing influence on how institutional investors behave. And in my view, this is this would be or is an important omission when it comes to thinking about the industry superannuation funds. This is because the industry funds have had a unique evolution, um, which I believe has important implications um, when thinking about the fund's present and future behavior. Okay, so let me now try to briefly give you a sense of the industry fund's unique evolution. And to do this, we need to go back to the 1980s because the 1980s uh, is the period when the industry superannuation funds first emerged. And they emerged during this period, not because of a financial markets development or as a result of government policy. They emerged during this period because of a strategic campaign um, that was waged by Australian trade unions. And the Australian trade unions were focused on superannuation during the 1980s for a few reasons. First, 
it had become apparent, clearly apparent by then, that um, the pension payment that I mentioned earlier, that social welfare payment paid by the government to older Australians, um, was going to be completely insufficient to afford older Australians a dignified retirement. Now, a couple of attempts had been made to introduce a government-administered supplemental retirement savings scheme, but those attempts, attempts failed as a result of insufficient political support. Now, at the time, um, the Australian trade unions had a peak representative body called the Australian Council of Trade Unions. Um, uh, it, that representative, that peak body, had um, some economically literate leaders who recognised the risk to union members of inadequate retirement provision. And given the political impasse that I just mentioned, they also appreciated that superannuation would only um, be achieved um, uh, through industrial disputation and negotiation at the workforce level rather than through legislative reform. That is, they realised that if anything was going to be done about superannuation to ensure that workers had adequate retirement provisions, um, uh, the unions had to take the lead. And so they began industrial an industrial campaign in the 1980s to compel employers to make superannuation contributions for employees. Now, there was no pre-existing legal framework uh, governing how those superannuation contributions would be handled. Instead, the unions and the employers had to negotiate the arrangements from the ground up. Um, now, importantly, the unions did not want the employers to establish, to establish corporate superannuation schemes. They didn't want each employer to establish its own superannuation scheme. And that is because some of those schemes had been in operation for a little while in Australia, and the unions had had quite a negative experience with them. Um, that negative experience related not only to the, the structure and terms of those corporate schemes, but also to the conduct of the large financial services companies that um, typically administered those corporate schemes on behalf of employers. So the unions didn't want to go down that path. They instead pushed for the establishment of a new type of superannuation scheme. Um, in simple terms, the model involved establishing a trust that would take and invest superannuation contributions paid by employers on behalf of employees in a particular industry. So I have here on this slide an example of a poster relating to the Building Union Superannuation Scheme. This was the uh, first industry fund. Uh, it came about as a result of the efforts of building and construction unions uh, who basically um, were able to uh, compel agreement from employers in the construction industry to pay superannuation contributions on behalf of employees who worked in this sector into this fund, which was called the Building Union Superannuation Scheme. And, and, and this just highlights that point I made earlier, that we call these funds industry funds because of this historical connection they had with particular industries. Now, um, significantly, the unions not only pushed for the establishment of these schemes, uh, once they were established, the unions inserted themselves into the management of these industry funds and sought to minimise significantly the involvement of Australia's large financial services companies. Now, the establishment of these schemes was by no means achieved seamlessly. There was instead a lot of industrial disputation around this initiative. And in particular, um, uh, a number of employers and employer representative bodies were hostile, uh, as was our, our, as were our right of centre political parties. So uh, there was considerable hostility towards the uh, establishment of the indus industry funds. In, in short, there was a concern that these would become some war chest for union activity. Um, this hostility uh, meant that the unions uh, and the managers of the new industry funds were acutely aware that they were involved in a novel and somewhat fraught 
exercise. Um, in order to allay, and, and, and you get a sense of the disputation around the establishment of these funds from this poster. Basically, this poster is saying uh, that employees cannot start work on a construction site unless they and their employer have signed up to the building union superannuation scheme. Now, in order to allay employer concerns about what was happening here, the unions um, ultimately made a pragmatic decision to involve employers in the operation of these new industry funds. And they achieved this by, um, by constituting the boards of the trustee companies that ran the, um, the various industry funds with equal numbers of union and employer representatives. Um, this became quite a, uh, 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 this was a sort of a well accepted um, approach and eventually became the dominant model for the industry funds. They were set up with this equal representation of union appointees and employer appointees on their boards. All right, so um, this origin story, which I have briefly um, uh, sought to convey, is is um, distinctly different from the institutional origins of other institutional investors and indeed other financial services companies <clears throat> operating in the Australian market. And it has several notable aspects that I do want to emphasise. First, the trade unions and eventually employers um, were key players in the industry funds. Um, their involvement has given the funds a connection to the Australian labour market and to the general business sector not just to the financial markets. Second, the industry funds represent an intentional departure from the established financial services sector. The unions deliberately limited the role of large financial services companies in the operation of the industry funds and sought to ensure that the industry funds could develop as a separate and distinct segment of our financial services sector. And certainly people who joined the funds in the early years and who stayed on to assume senior leadership positions were very much conscious that they were at the vanguard of a, of a new superannuation industry and were embarking on a distinctly different career path. And they often have described this as akin to becoming involved in a, in a movement. Um, Third, the industry fund sector has had to grow and establish itself in the face of significant commercial and political scrutiny and hostility. Uh, and that certainly characterised the early years of the funds, but importantly, it has continued or it continued right up until uh, well into the 2000s. Um, and this... this um, uh, 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 background of, hosti of, of hostility and scrutiny contrasts, for example, with other key players in our financial services sector who have been able really until just a few years ago to avoid uh, much robust scrutiny of their behaviour. Um, the various challenges that the funds had to face in their early years um, prompted them to adopt what today is probably one of their most distinct characteristics, and that is their strategic use of collective action. Um, and this consists of two broad strategies. Firstly, the funds um, have, uh, have established and sought to promote a distinct collective identity for the sector. And they do this through a collective marketing campaign, um, uh, which uh, Australian listeners will be uh, uh, very familiar with, which um, seeks to embrace and highlight the fact that they are uh, different from other financial services companies in Australia. The other sort of um, um, limb to this collective active, active uh, collective action strategy um, has been the establishment of a range of organisations that would support the industry funds. Now, uh, this goes back to the early years when the unions who had established the funds were, were very conscious that they wanted the funds to have the wherewithal to stand on their two feet and to avoid being captured by um, our established financial services companies. So they set about creating an ecosystem of organisations that would support the industry funds. So this included the establishment of a dedicated asset management manager, a dedicated asset consultant, 
a, a, a lobbying and advocacy group uh, and an organisation that undertakes corporate governance, advocacy and interventions on behalf of the industry funds. All right, let me conclude by reflecting on the significance of this historical perspective. As the quotation on this slide shows, it's it's referring to um, the uh, the CEO, or the, until recently uh, he's retired. Um, it's referring to that CEO of Australian Super, and as the quotation shows, um, is an example. It's an example of the fact that the industry fund does uh, the the industry fund sector does like to assert its unique qualities. Um, and, and not only do they say that, there's been some recent academic studies into fund performance and leadership, which is also which have also identified what they consider is a distinct culture amongst the leadership of the industry funds. Now, a historical perspective helps to put the flesh onto the bones of these claims. It highlights the fund's novel industrial origins their growth in the face of scrutiny and hostility, um, the sense of mission or purpose that their leadership have. I refer to them often talking about their consciousness that they're involved in a movement, that they were embarking in a career path distinctly different from any established or conventional career path in Australia's financial services industry. Um, you know, the historical perspective highlights the clear stakeholder connections uh, uh, through the involvement of unions and employers in the funds. Um, and it also highlights the funds uh, strategic use of collective action. And all of these are attributes um, that one would not typically associate with many other institutional investors operating in Australia. And they are attributes that I believe need to be factored in, in in when thinking about the way these industry funds behave. Um, now, of course, it's difficult to quantify the precise effect of these attributes on industry fund behaviour, um, but I do believe they play some role, for example, in explaining the distinctive examples of shareholder activism that I referred to on one of the earlier slides. Now, a historical perspective also provides a warning. Um, it, 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 a warning about the future behavior of the industry funds. Um, by showing us how some distinctive attributes of the industry funds are, are rooted in history, they're essentially historical artifacts, that sense of mission, that development through uh, hostility and scrutiny, those things that I just mentioned uh, are historical artifacts. They're not hardwired in the legislation governing the superannuation sector of Australia. They're not hardwired in trust deeds. Those attributes come about because of the rather unique evolution of the industry funds. As we move further away in time from the formation of the funds, um, those attributes may fade away. Indeed, it's now more than 30 years since the industry funds first began to move. These industry funds, as the asset under management figures that I provided earlier show, are now very substantial financial services organisations. Um, the large ones have operations across the globe, and their size is such that they now need to recruit from uh, broadly within uh, from the financial services sector. Um, uh, the leaders of the funds, the leaders of the funds through their formative, formative years are now retiring from the sector as well. Um, so all this creates the very real possibility of, of, of institutional and cultural change as the funds move away from their historical roots. Uh, and this change, you know, as they move further away and, and, and uh, creates the risk of the attributes that I've mentioned may fade, could well be happening just at a time when the funds are achieving ascendancy in the Australian market. Think about those figures that I noted at the outset of this presentation. Um, and, and this creates a question, you know, insofar as there is such a change, how might that drive changes in the behaviour of these significant industry funds in our market? So a historical perspective unveils this important issue. 
uh, that creates uncertain implications for our capital market. It creates uncertain implications for the future of our corporate governance. Um, we can see from the economic data that these funds are going to become significant players, gatekeepers, as I characterize them. Um, but the historical perspective shows that some important foundations to their behavior may are merely historical artifacts, may be at risk of, of, of fading away over time. And that creates uncertainty about how these players will behave in coming years. And, uh, and therefore, I found a historical perspective highly relevant uh, as part of my broader project about thinking about the behavior of these important institutional investors. Thank you.